you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, this is Voss here from thechrismasshow.com. There you go. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate it. When the Iron Lady sings it, that makes it official. You know, for 14, 15 years, I had to sing that line, and we just got tired of it, and it was time to hire somebody else who's better at it. Anyway, folks, welcome to the big show. As always, we bring you the most smartest, most brilliant minds on the show. The CEO, the the CEOs, we, yeah, there's more than one over 15 years. The billionaires, the White House advisor, presidential advisors, the governors, the congress members, the U.S. ambassadors, the astronauts, the TV and print, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and authors on the show. And they come and they bring you this distilled version of their life journeys, their stories, their lessons. And as we always say in the Chris Voss show, stories are the owner's manual to life or not. There you go. Anyway, we have a returning guest that we've had on every year for CES. He's a good friend of mine. Gary Shapiro is going to be joining us on the show. He is the president and CEO of the Consumer Technology Association, which represents over 1,500, I'm sure this number is probably outdated, consumer technology companies and owns and produces the Consumer Electronics Show CES. It's known by, and we're going to be talking about what's going on next week with the CES Show twenty. 24 and he's acclaimed author lobbyist and president ceo welcome to the show gary how are you chris it is great to be back on your show it means that ces is really happening there you go it's not official until you're on the show every year gary that's how it works <laughs> yeah I, I don't know if this has been a continuous stream but i feel we do this and things happen that are nice and ces goes well so there you go there you go so give Maybe us a little show there you go. Well, we try to be. So there you go. Give us a 30,000 overview of what CES is, maybe for people who don't quite know, and, and what, what, it, what, what show you put on there. Well, CES is the most powerful tech event in the world. It's where people come with amazing new innovations, and they get together from around the globe. It's probably, by our research, is the biggest U.S. event in terms of attracting people from overseas of any type, including sporting events. So we're, we're expecting around 130,000 people we may reach, and more than one out of three of those people will be from outside the United States. So you're figuring out over 40,000 people coming from outside the U.S. And we'll have, I don't know what numbers you saw, but they became outdated quickly in the last several weeks. We're over 4,000 exhibitors oh, now. We'll be in over 2.5 million net square feet of exhibit space. And that will include 1,200 startups. And it's just the biggest show of many types and many different vertical categories. So the big thing is it's a trade event. It's not open to consumers. And we attract these people from around the world who are focused on innovation because they want to see the coolest, newest things. They want to solve big problems. And they want to see each other to do deals. There you go. As someone in our live feed says from Facebook, it's that time of year again. Have you considered lobbying Congress to change the term January to a CES show month? Congress has bigger problems than that. And <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Last year, we didn't have a Speaker of the House during CES. And you know, this year, Congress is trying to get an immigration and, and funding bills, and they have important work to do. And I would never, ever try to tell them what to do on the big issues like that. There you go. Well, I mean, you know, it is kind of a big issue changing January, but I think it would be appropriate at this point because like everybody knows, it's like, well, what, what time of the year is it? It's CES show time. Well, so, but Chris, just to point out, I, I should mention, because I know I'm being monitored by my team, that we have several senators coming. We yeah. have well over 100 or 150 or so different government representatives of everything from the head of the Consumer Product Safety Commission to the FCC commissioners to FTC to international ministers, including. And we also have the Prince of the Netherlands, Prince Constantine wow. Van Orange coming. A lot of policymakers from around the world because their technology raises big issues and we have to talk about them. Plus, a lot of the companies or the countries are there because their countries have pavilions and they want to talk about how big they are. 
So there's a, a lot of important people coming from around the world. There you go. How big do you think AI is going to be this year? Everybody, you know, it's pretty hot. AI will definitely be the overriding discussion at the show. Companies will be doing all sorts of stuff with it. They'll be announcing it at the show. I think you'll see a lot of the booths will mention AI or talk about things from digital twins to solving problems to new features, all sorts of cool stuff. And everyone from the car companies to computer companies to all sorts of products, even like Microsoft's big announcement just in the last 24 hours about their special key on their keyboard Microsoft will be there and, and talking about that, and, and I assume that that's when people see that and be able to touch the physical manifestation of that. There you go. Did somebody preempted my question here, so I'll let them ask it. Corey Sanders asks, Tallboy here, this is year 12 for me at CES. What are you looking forward to seeing this year? Well, we have so many firsts this year. It's kind of cool. We have our first beauty tech keynote. For those of us who need help with makeup and things like that, and L'Oreal has been coming to the show in various ways for several years and exhibiting, but now they're, they're the opening keynote. So I'll be on the stage with Kinsey Fabrizio and, and we'll kick in, go right into the L'Oreal keynote on Tuesday morning at the, Las Ve at the Venetian, Venetian Convention Center. But also, I mean, we have some other great keynotes, like the, the first time physically present, not only will the CEO of Walmart, Oh, wow. be keynoting, but Walmart will have an activation on the show floor showing what they could do with technology. Also, yeah. CEO of Siemens, another European company keynoting. There's such a big company in so many different categories, especially AI with digital twins. And then a health company, Elevance Health, which is a huge, huge healthcare company speaking. And we have our first, in a sense, infrastructure company keynoting, HD Hyundai from Korea. Oh, which wow. makes big boats. In addition, Hyundai also will be there with a different portion of the company showing their cars, including the Kia cars, both the first time ever they've had Hyundai and Kia cars at CES. CEO of NASDAQ will be speaking. CEO of Best Buy will be speaking. CEOs of Intel and of Snap. And about 950 other speakers will be there. So I look forward to the conference programming, but of course, walking the exhibit hall is really exciting. There you go. We had the previous CEO of Best Buy on this year for his book. So this is going to be exciting and stuff, all the different things that are going into it. I don't know how long CES has been doing this. How long has the CES show been going on for now? So CES started in 1967 in New York City, moved to Chicago in June, and then it became twice a year in June and January. And when January was so cold, no one left their hotel room well below zero. So we were the first business event of any size to move to Las Vegas in 1976, I believe. This is all before my time, although I know I look older. Uh, and then the Las Vegas show got very big and the Chicago show kind of shrunk. There wasn't much going on in the industry and it went away. And now the Las Vegas CES event is, is almost always, you know, the top of the trade show list in terms of the largest size by most, by most measures, not only in the U.S., but probably in the world. And it's, it's something where we've gotten into new categories because we want to, right now in technology, we've been saying for 15 years, and I've said it on your show, every company is a technology company. And, but to be a technology company, you have to deal with other technology companies. You have to cross license. You have to learn what's going on. You have to understand what the, how, which chips are coming out and what they do. And whether it's the car companies, which have come in big and huge, so we're the, probably the biggest car show in the world now, to a mobility, including... Now we have a whole bunch of not only things that go up in the air with people in them and other things, but also things on water, but also other forms of mobility like electric. There's some great announcements coming from a whole bunch of companies in that area of getting around using electric cars or using electric scooters or things like that. So in many different categories, we're there. The other category, which has grown phenomenally, especially because in, of COVID in part, was digital health. Mm -hmm. There's so much in the shelf floor now about how we could deal with the fact we have an old older population we're living longer we got a lot of things that can be fixed but we don't have enough people to fix them or monitor them we don't have enough doctors and nurses and technicians is a huge shortage so digital health technology is stepping in big time to fill that gap there you go everyone's a technology company that's how you need to think of yourself nowadays and maybe an ai company at this pace it's crazy the impact that's happening so i'm just going to let Corey answer all my questions that i have set up for you on the show has the development of eureka park work for ces any standouts in the past that you like maybe you know eureka park was goes back to our roots on my very first board meeting i attended i was a consultant to the association i was just overwhelmed because 
the discussion was whether to raise the cost of exhibiting. Mm-hmm. And the and the chairman of the board, who is the largest exhibitor CEO, said, it doesn't matter to us. It's a rounding error. We spend all our money on transportation, entertainment, building booths. The cost of space is irrelevant. It's a rounding error. He said, but we always have to keep the show so that anyone with an idea can expose it to the thousands of journalists like yourself, Chris, mm-hmm. and uh, distributors, retailers, investors, potential partners. And thus, on the idea of Eureka Park, and it's, it's now over 1,200 startups. Wow. Um, and you know what I think? I think back actually to the last CES the, where I was really inspired. And I know it's, it, you, the question was really about a product I saw, but it was a group that I saw. And it was a group of exhibitors from Ukraine. And here they had this horrible war going on, you know, major suffering. And they developed some really interesting things because they had to. They didn't have mm-hmm. a choice. Like one of the things that stuck out in my mind, there's a company that took leaves and turned them into paper. So mm-hmm. stuff that we throw out on our side of our lawn, they're, they're making paper out of it. And now since the show, they've gotten some contracts around the world. That to me was memorable and inspiring and exciting. There you go. Note to self, stop throwing away the leaves. All right. <laughs> so this is, this is really exciting. That's funny. 1967. I was born in 68. Boy, I feel old now. <laughs> Well, Chris, we're also celebrating our 100th anniversary as an association. You know, we started as the the Radio Manufacturers Association 100 years ago in Chicago. Wow. And no, that's not my celebration of 100 years. I am younger than that. But it's funny because we we were working with a variety of broadcasters then. And 100 years later, here we are in Congress where Congress is wasting its time pushing legislation which would mandate that every car sold had an AM radio in it. No, you don't believe this is true, I, I but this is what the broadcasters are pushing for. And it's <laughs> ironic this is our 100th anniversary to require a, a 100-year-old product. It's like requiring a fax machine on every spaceship, basically. It's just, <laughs> this is antiquated old technology, and I, it's tough to come up with a scenario where it would really matter. They're trying yeah. to solve the safety issue and trying to use things like seat belts as a as a precedent, but it's it's a stretch. There you go. Well, CTA as a group, you know, as an association, you guys lobby Congress, you guys lobby lawmakers, I imagine statewide around the nation and stuff. What are what are some of the things that you maybe you, you you're you're pushing for in lobbying or you know, I see you talk about different things on LinkedIn and things. What are what are some of the things that you, you think maybe needs to happen legislative wise to to improve business environment for businesses? So everything we do revolves around one very easy principle, and that is, will this help or hurt innovation, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially American companies? Because although the show is a global event, we are an American association, and we count Canada as part of the United States partnership there. Mm -hmm. So we represent Canadian and U.S. companies. And what we do is we focus on policies which support innovation. So what supports immigration? Well, getting the best and brightest to the United States, highly skilled immigration, A huge number of our companies have been founded by immigrants. There's something in there about, you know, you're willing to give up where you live and come in another place. It's an immigrant mentality. And you had extremely bright, creative people willing to take risks. And we need them in the U.S. That's our secret sauce. Another one is we are focused on on trade and free trade. We think that's important that you be able to do things around the world. We recognize that, you know, there's national security issues, which we have to address. We certainly I try to figure out ways to to buy stuff from our friends and our partners. That's important, but trade. And then as these new technologies come along, we want we don't say we're against government regulation. We just want to know what's legal. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot easier if there's one national policy. For example, the U.S. does not have a national policy or law compared to China and most European countries on self-driving cars. We're mm-hmm. behind on that as a country. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really horrible. And it's the trial lawyers and frankly, the unions, which have bottled it up in Congress, they, they're, you know, there's a whole industry that relies on people getting hurt and killed, the carnage mm-hmm. industry of everyone from the lawyers to others that make money off of that. But that would solve a lot of our health care problems and backups if we could reduce the number of car accidents, which we can technically. We just can't do it legally at this point. Yeah. And there's things like privacy where we don't want to be like China, where there is no privacy and they're surging and beating us on artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't want to be like Europe, where everything is about privacy and there's, there's not that much innovation in the AI area because of that. Mm-hmm. We want to be Goldilocks right in the middle. And that's yeah. what we're advocating for. And we need national laws. Having these laws where each state does things, whether it's on right to repair 
or on privacy is just a recipe for disaster for American businesses and takes away the biggest competitive advantage that we have as American companies. And the other thing we want to do is for the administration to stop, stop attacking our best companies and to start and stop telling Europe how they could sue them and extort money from them, whether it's Google, yeah. Meta, Facebook, Apple, anyone. And we have literally have American government employees in Europe instructing Europeans how to sue our country, how our companies. It's just, this is the height of insanity. We have the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission who does not believe big companies should be allowed to buy small companies. So what's happened in the last year? Investment in small companies and entrepreneurs and innovators has dried up because you're not, if you're an investor, you need an exit and you mm -hmm. can either go public or you could sell to a bigger company. If the big companies are blocked as they are today because they sue or they threaten to sue, so they have chilled the money. Now, look, higher interest rates are a factor there also. I get that. But our own federal government, this administration, is clearly the, not as helpful as they should be. In fact, they're harmful to innovation and startups. Yeah. And innovation is everything. I mean, people don't realize, I think, when I hear people talk about, well, you know, we need to overregulate AI. Maybe we need to stop it. You know, there's been arguments from Silicon Valley on, on stopping any AI innovation. But people don't realize, like you said, China is at it. I know Russia is doing their own AI. You know, every company in the world is probably trying to get an edge. Is This is the new future vision and technology. And and so, yeah, we, we've got to be innovated to win. You know, we're we're not in the 1950s anymore where, you know, we're the biggest market in the world and we're, and we're, I think we're still the biggest market in the world technically, or I think India crossed us, but uh, you know, we're, we're just not, we're just not always going to be number one by guaranteed by our size and market. So we've got to, we've got to keep our edge. I couldn't agree with you more. It is not God given that we are going to be as strong as we are. And we're doing a lot of really, really not helpful things as a country. It's not only our divisive politics, it's the fact that we have anti-innovation policies out there mm -hmm. uh, in almost every way. And it's, you know, some things are, I, in fairness, like, for example, the Senate had a series of uh, informal hearings, which I participated in, on artificial intelligence on a bipartisan way. And they're, they're taking a very thoughtful approach to how AI could be best served in, in, in the country in terms of a policy. And, you know, I think there's a consensus. We need a national policy. We need companies need to know what's legal. But this idea of start like there was a you know, crazy idea that even smart people like Elon Musk were pushing for a while. But so let's stop AI for six months. I mean, that was crazy. Yeah. It was like the bad guys will ignore that. And meanwhile, you know, the good companies that follow or our companies will have to go follow that. And so mm -hmm. that was that idea is a dead idea, fortunately. But the, we just did some research. We found that, that it's only about five percent of the population which thinks AI is a bad thing that's going to cause a major problem. I think most people have good thoughts about AI. They see mm -hmm. the the solutions that are out there. It's already being used in companies to take out a lot of the the boring work in companies. A lot of writing is being done by AI. A lot of reaction to things. It'll help help us with healthcare enormously once it's realized. So you'll know. You know, it'll, it'll look at the data and figure out what kind of illness you have and how it should be treated for someone that's like, a, you know, that's your demographic, a certain age, sex, blood type, DNA, all that. And I think it's going to jump us in the future really healthily and quickly if we just, you know, get it right and, and create the guardrails for legality and stop just talking about the bad things, which are extraordinarily unlikely to happen. Definitely. The bad guys will use it too. So the good guys have got to get ahead of it. You know, one of the things I've been talking about lately is the disinformation the AI is going to create. We're already seeing that. You know, we, we have a lot of AI guests on the show and, you know, we're talking about the upcoming politics. We don't really want to get into politics, but, you know, the facial was that it's the it's the fake facial facial technology that makes it look like you're saying something but you're not it, where it can be spoofed you know and, and ai is going to be used probably a lot in the next political cycle and then of course you know there's all sorts of distribution i, I have people reaching out to me going hey we want to use your likeness to create a website and you you're, you'll be your own ai bot and i'm like no because i'm going to give you licensing to my to my persona or my personality and my and you know, fifteen years of our of our data, and then I don't have to fight you over it because you're going to have access to it. And so I'm starting to think from a person. I think a lot of people are 
that are smart about the business is how is my likeness going to be used, the control of it? You know, we're seeing the copyright lawsuits and all those sort of things where people are fighting over chat GPT and the training and different things that are going into it. So it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting few years as to how that plays out and what goes on. For my next book that's coming out in October, and we got to plug your book too that's coming out in third quarter, I'm interviewing a lot of CEOs. And one of the things I'm hearing a lot of is people are wanting to move to nearshoring. Have you heard this term? I'm sure you have. Oh, absolutely. We have a, yeah. If you're writing a book, we have some research we can give you, which is very interesting. Love to see it. But we, are we you seeing? Uh, hired Kearney, the big consulting firm, to look at it because there was proposals in Congress to just cut off all imports or cut off all imports from China. Mm-hmm. And we said, you know, that that would that can't be done without creating a major disaster. Obviously, as I indicated earlier, national security, that's a good area of focus. But what we've advocated is go to your friends. BFF, best friends forever. Go to people like Japan and Korea and Europe and mm-hmm. share our democratic values. Even Vietnam and India where we have trade agreements and, and try to figure out there and figure out what it is that you're good at in trade. We don't have the workforce. We don't have the capability to build factories. Even this CHIP Act, which is well-intentioned, mm-hmm. you know, first of all, we don't have the skill. It's, taking, it's going to take longer than everyone thinks it is to get those factories built. And so, because we don't have the the, the, the people here with the skills to build those type of factories. Yeah. And second of all, the administration took a good thing and they layered on it all these requirements. You have to have nursery facilities. You have to pay the prevailing wage for everyone that, that's building the, the constructing the factory. You have to do all these things that make it much more expensive for companies to do it, wow. which makes no sense at all, frankly. Yeah. But that's, that's politics. So nearshoring is a real issue. We have a lot of data. We did all these studies about what should be built where and how we should do with our friends. But basically, it falls under best friends forever. Let's, let's work as a country with our friends and build up those relationships. There you go. I mean, what, from what I'm hearing, and I think there was something else on, I just read on LinkedIn last week, nearshoring is, you know, there, people, there was so much you know, conundrum over, over all the different supply chains and what was going on with COVID and stuff. There's the China rattling the sabers on Taiwan and the chip issue there. And so nearshoring, it seems like a lot of it's moving to Mexico and Canada and different things. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, it should be, it should be very interesting. You're showing it is a, is a real, I think, movement. And I think mm-hmm. it's real. I mean, we even see, you were talking about you're showing, and you, you can see this at CES. There's a lot of solutions that people have just for agriculture, for example, or food production, things <laughs> like that. I mean, we have a relationship now with the United Nations. Not only did they, you know, last CES, we work with them on promoting these fundamental human securities, like the right to f- to not be hungry, the right to food, the right to health care, the right to clean air, the right to clean water, the right to personal security. But they've added a new one. And the new one, I was pleased to announce it with them at the United Nations itself in, in, in the fall. And that is the right to access to technology to solve all these other problems. So I think that's, that's really good for us. They'll be at the, uh, I'm breaking news here, Chris, because I don't think we've announced this. Huh? But at the opening keynote, we will have a representative from the United Nations talking about why they added this new right and what they're doing with all these other things. There you go. Now let's get a plug in for, you have a book coming out and somebody's already kind of put up a thing for it. Pivot or die, I believe in the third quarter you mentioned of 2024. Yeah, that's, that's another big news story you're breaking here. I don't think that's public yet. <laughs> it's, um, it's on the internet. I was, Googling, I was Googling your bio and books and I was telling your staff this before the show. There's a, there's a, somebody who's put up a pre-sale for it. <laughs> That's how I found out. I, I didn't know that. I'll have to Google it myself. Yeah. Well, Maybe you, know, you should well, send him a, a C&D for a thing. The title is Pivot or Die. I mean, I have a publisher's contract with Harper, or we do, I should say CTA yeah. does, my employer, with Harper Collins who've done the last two books I wrote. But yeah, if that's the title, that's the title. But the, <laughs> the, <laughs> there's some controversy over that. I like the title. I mean, it, it does have a certain finality to yeah. it. The die word is, you know, I usually say innovate or die has been what I've been saying for 15 years. Mm-hmm. But pivot or die can work as well. But it really talks about, in the context of COVID, what we've learned, how we shift quickly. And the fact is, is that everyone in life, from companies to people, take a picture of the world as they see it at that moment. And they think that's going to stay the same. But the only thing certain in life is that everything's going to change. <laughs> and you have to be ready for those changes. And you have to deal with those changes. And, you know, we could have a long discussion about COVID and how we dealt with it as a country and as people. But the important thing is, is that, you know, some companies did well and some companies did not. And I like to talk about both examples in different ways of, of how you pivoted, what you do. I mean, personally, we pivoted. I mean, 
I even talk about this. My wife, uh, who you've met, is a doctor, and she figured it out like in January and came home and said, Gary, the whole world's about to change. This wow. is the most serious. I just heard this radio story about this little city in China that's like, we've been there. We know what that means. This is, this is wow. coming to the United States. So how do we respond to that? What do we do? What do we do as an organization? I mean, you might recall, we canceled the physical show in Las Vegas for 21. Mm -hmm. And we did it in, we made the decision in May and we announced it in, in June or July and people were angry at us. Like, why would you cancel the show? There's everything will be cured by then. It's like, no, it won't. And you know, so anyway, there's a, there's the story there is, is, is two things. One, if, if you have some information you, that's important, you, you better act on it and consider it and go through the likelihoods and the ratios. And you have to, you have to be ready to move. You have there to be ready to move quickly. And so let's get a plug in for your other, I think you have two other books, Ninja Future, Secrets of Success in the World of Innovation, and Ninja Innovation, The Killer Strategies of Successful Businesses. Do oh, I if you want to go back, there's the comeback. There's the comeback. There you the go. The fraud by Mark Cuban. Ah, Mark Cuban. There you, there you go. one of those on the internet. Um, there you go. And Mark will be at CES. Uh, not only will he be speaking on a panel, but he will be there as part of, I don't know if it's okay to pitch another Please. TV show. Go, go. But you certainly are aware of Shark Tank. So Shark yeah. Tank will be there, you know, going through through Eureka Park and they'll be having uh, tryouts and things like that. So a lot of the sharks will be there. And that's, you know, I love Mark Cuban. He's, he's my hero. That's one of my favorite shows. I think it's been so good for entrepreneurs and inspiring them to seeing how kind of the whole process works and everything else. So is there anything we haven't touched on? What's coming up for CES? Anything you want to plug that you're excited about, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, I, I'm just excited about the whole show, our focus on sustainability throughout and the, uh, the different parts of the event, whether it's mobility or healthcare or AI or sustainability. We're getting, we're just in so many different areas right now that it's, it's an inspiring event that starts the year off on a positive, optimistic note. We'll have, you know, almost 5,000 press there mm -hmm. like yourself. So it's a, it's a global event. And a lot of your audience I know would be qualified to go. It's not too late. You could sign up, but you have to be prove that you're affiliated with the innovation industry and world, whether you're a reporter or distributor or retailer and investor whatever. And that's, uh, that will get you into CES. There you go. The cutting edge of technology. There was one more question I had for you. Oh, since 2020, you guys have been doing an audio online, an online version where people can tune in if they're not at CES. Are you guys doing that again still in, in? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we will be showing a lot of the keynotes and we will certainly be doing that in, on our website, ces.tech. And you will be able to see a lot of the, some of the featured programming. Then after the show, we'll have an archive of a lot of the, of what's going on there, you know, and with 4,500 exhibit, 4,000 exhibitors, rather, it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a lift, but we try to get as much information out as we reasonably can. There you go. Well, Gary, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it, man. Thank you, Chris. I look forward to seeing you live in person at CES next week. There you go. And and hopefully all the years coming too, for that matter. I want to stick around. Me too. Me too. Me too. <laughs> so thank you very much, Gary. Everyone can check it out. What's the dot com people can go look this up at? CES dot T E C H dot tech. There you go. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one on the tickety talkity, Chris Foss, Facebook.com, and all the other crazy places we're in the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.